Dinosaurs are among the most successful land animals ever to have existed. They roamed the earth for more than 150 million years. They lived on every continent and evolved into a dazzling variety of forms. Gigantic plant eaters some larger than a house shared their world with tiny chicken-sized meat eaters and with many other dinosaur species of all shapes and sizes. Their name means terrible lizard. Dinosaurs dominated the earth until a combination of environmental disasters caused their extinction about 65 million years ago. But one group the bird survives. Dinosaurs were reptiles, animals with a backbone and four legs and with a scaly, waterproof skin. Like most other reptiles, dinosaurs laid eggs with shells. Detailed studies of anatomy have shown that extinct dinosaurs are most closely related to the crocodiles and birds among living animals. The skeletons of birds and dinosaurs share a number of features not found in other animal groups, such as modifications to the legs that make them more efficient runners. Other shared features include lightly built limb bones, features of the skull and jaws, and a hinged ankle. On the other hand, dinosaurs differ from their crocodilian cousins, and from all other reptiles, in a number of important ways. The most significant of these differences are found in the bones of the feet, legs and hips. Most kinds of reptiles hold their legs out from the sides of the body and move their legs through wide arcs as they walk. This style of walking is called sprawling, and is not much different from how early vertebrates walked when they came out onto land. Some lizards can run on their hind legs only, but their legs still stick out to the sides. And crocodiles, in addition to sprawling, can tuck their hind limbs under the body to do a high walk on land. In contrast, Dinosaurs had legs that could only be held directly underneath the body. Much like the legs of a mammal such as a dog or a horse. As a result, dinosaurs could not sprawl like other reptiles. The long, straight legs of dinosaurs could make very long strides, and footprints show that they put one foot in front of the other as they walked or ran. Dinosaurs lived millions of years ago during a period of time that is known as the Mesozoic Era. At this time, the Earth was quite different from the planet we know today. The land, Sea and sky were populated with many unfamiliar animals and plants, and even the shapes of the continents were different. Although all of these things seem strange to us, this world was also home to the ancestors of many of the living things that we see around us today. The Mesozoic era is divided into three periods, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. The Triassic period is the earliest of these divisions. It lasted from about 245 to 213 million years ago. During the Triassic period, all of the continents were joined together in a huge single landmass that scientists call Pangaea. The Earth was relatively warm and dry at this time and was covered with large deserts. The polar ice caps that now cover Antarctica and Greenland were absent during the entire Mesozoic era. Dinosaurs first evolved in this environment. Great monsoon seasons alternated with dry periods over much of the globe. Gradually, dinosaurs became more abundant, while a number of other animal groups, such as the ancestors of mammals, became scarcer. Meat eaters, such as Colophysis, and plant eating prosauropods, such as Plateosaurus, were two kinds of dinosaurs that lived at this time. The late Triassic period can be regarded as the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. Following the Triassic period, the Jurassic period began 213 million years ago and continued until the beginning of the Cretaceous period 144 million years ago. During this time, the world's weather became wetter, though it still remained warmer than today. The extra moisture helped plants to colonize the deserts and turn them into forests of huge trees and prairies of ferns and other low-growing plants. The continents started to break apart from each other at the beginning of the Jurassic period. Great seas began to open up between North America and Europe and between Europe and Africa. These seas became today's Atlantic Ocean and Mediterranean Sea. During the Jurassic period, dinosaurs increased in number, and many more different types of dinosaurs appeared, including the gigantic long-necked sauropods, armored dinosaurs such as Stegosaurus and large meat-eaters such as Allosaurus. The final division of the Mesozoic era is the Cretaceous period. Dinosaurs reached their greatest numbers at this time, in a world that was changing rapidly. By the end of the Cretaceous period, the continents were beginning to reach the positions they occupy today, although India was a large island isolated from all other land. Australia, Antarctica and South America were still joined to each other by narrow land bridges. The world's temperature peaked at the start of the Cretaceous period but cooled as time went on. This was the time of the great predator Tyrannosaurus rex, the three-horned Triceratops and the duck-billed Hadrosaurs. But at the end of the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago, all of these amazing animals disappeared, along with many other types of animals and plants. The reasons for this are still being debated by scientists, but the close of the Cretaceous period marks the end of the age of dinosaurs. No dinosaurs, except for the birds, survived into the following Cenozoic era, 
which is often called the age of mammals. Dinosaurs shared their world with many other creatures that are now extinct. While dinosaurs roamed the land, enormous marine reptiles ruled the oceans. Flying reptiles swooped through the skies, catching insects and fish and occasionally tackling even larger prey. Alongside these animals, the small, early relatives of mammals and birds tried to make a living, while avoiding becoming a small meal for some larger animals. Many of the animal groups alive today originated during the Mesozoic era. Mammals like the shrew-sized Morganocodon appeared during the late Triassic period. But for most of the Mesozoic era, mammals were small, secretive animals about the size of rats or rabbits. They became the dominant animals only after the dinosaurs had disappeared. Frogs and crocodiles also evolved during the Triassic period, as did the turtles and tortoises. Lizards are first known in the Jurassic period, and the first bird, Archaeopteryx, flew through late Jurassic skies. Snakes slithered into existence during the Cretaceous period. Flying reptiles, or pterosaurs, appeared in the late part of the Triassic period and survived until the end of the Cretaceous period. Pterosaurs came in a variety of sizes. Many were about the size of pigeons and crows, but others were as large as eagles and albatrosses. The largest flying animal ever was a pterosaur. Quetzalcoatlus, from the late Cretaceous period of North America, had a wingspan of about 36 feet, 11 meters larger than a small airplane. Pterosaur wings were each made from one very long finger that supported a thin, but very strong, flap of skin. This flap of skin is attached to the side of the body. Many pterosaurs lived around rivers, lakes and shallow seas. Most pterosaurs ate insects, fish and other small animals. Spectacular marine reptiles, including the ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, pleosaurs and mosasaurs, inhabited the Mesozoic seas. Of these animals, the ichthyosaurs were the most highly adapted to life in the sea. They looked extremely similar to dolphins, with long, pointed snouts full of sharp teeth, fins for steering, and a powerful crescent-shaped tail. Ichthyosaurs could not leave the sea to lay eggs, so they gave birth to live young while still in the water. Plesiosaurs had long, snake-like necks, short, squat bodies, and small heads equipped with sharp, pointed teeth. Their legs were modified into large paddles that they beat up and down to fly through the water. Pleosaurs were a group of plesiosaurs that had shorter necks and much larger heads. One type of pleosaur, Leopleurodon, had one of the largest meat-eating skulls ever to have existed. The head of this creature was over 6 feet 6 inches, 2 meters, long. Mosasaurs were gigantic lizards closely related to living monitor lizards. They lived during the late Cretaceous period. All of these marine reptiles lived on a diet of fish, squid and shellfish. The largest pleosaurs often ate other marine reptiles. With the exception of turtles, all marine reptiles became extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period. Dinosaur eggs and nests were first recognized from discoveries by the American Museum of Natural History in Mongolia's desert, the Gobi, led by Roy Chapman Andrews in the 1920s. They provided scientists with their first ideas about how dinosaurs might have raised and cared for their young. A number of recent discoveries in the western United States and in Mongolia, including embryos and baby dinosaurs, have greatly improved our knowledge of dinosaur birth. Careful study of these precious fossils has shown that dinosaur nesting behavior was very similar to that of living birds. Dinosaur eggs come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Some eggs are circular and about the size of a tennis ball, whereas others are up to 21 inches 53 centimeters, in length and have an elliptical shape. This might seem very big, but even these eggs are not as large as those laid by the biggest birds, such as the extinct elephant birds of Madagascar. Current evidence suggests that all dinosaurs laid eggs and that the eggs were laid in nests. The total number of eggs laid in a single nest was about 22 for the small theropods Oviraptor and Troodon, and up to 25 for the duck-billed Myosaura. Troodon appears to have laid its eggs in pairs, probably over a period of several hours, until the complete clutch had been deposited in the nest. In contrast, Myosaura seems to have laid its eggs in a spiral pattern, starting at one side of the nest and working around it until all of the eggs were in place. Most of our information on Myasaur and nests comes from a spectacular locality in Montana called Egg Mountain. This area contains evidence of many dozens of nests. Analysis of the rock types on Egg Mountain shows that this area was an island in a shallow lake during the late Cretaceous period. It appears that herds of Myasaur use this island as a communal nest site. The nests are situated very close to each other, but are separated by just enough space for an adult Myasaur to move around in without trampling on its eggs. These nesting colonies must have been very noisy, smelly and crowded places, much like penguin colonies of modern times. However, by living together so closely, the Myasaur herd were able to protect their young much more easily. The shallow waters that surrounded the island might also have offered some protection from predators.
In a handful of cases, scientists have been lucky enough in eggs. So far, embryos are known for the theropods Troodon, Oviraptor, and Therizinosaurus, the ornithopod Myasaur and an unnamed sauropod from South America. A number of skeletons from very young baby dinosaurs have also been discovered. These fossils provide important information on the ways in which dinosaurs grew and developed, and also tell us something about the ways that parents cared for their young. Examination of the tiny bones from Myasaura babies has shown that the leg bones were not fully formed at the time when the animals hatched. It appears that the legs were quite weak and that the young hatchlings were incapable of running or walking properly. As a result, the babies were probably confined to the nest during the first few weeks of their lives. This idea is confirmed by the presence of many fragments of trampled, broken eggshell in the nests. If the babies had left the nest soon after hatching, the eggshells would not have been broken up in this way. While the babies were restricted to their nests, their parents would supply them with food, water and protection. Newly hatched Myasaura were about 12 inches, 30 centimeters, in length. But they grew very quickly, and reached a length of about 5 feet, 1.5 meters, in only a few weeks. At this point, the babies were big enough and strong enough to leave the nest and join the rest of the herd. In contrast to the high levels of parental care seen in Myasaura, Troodon babies were left to fend for themselves as soon as they had hatched. Troodon nests often contain the remains of hatched eggs. These eggs lack the top part of the shell, which was removed by the baby as it hatched out, but otherwise show little evidence of trampling. This suggests that the babies did not remain in the nest for long after hatching. The limb bones of Troodon babies were well formed and strong, so the youngsters could scamper away from the nest and begin searching for their own food almost immediately. These tiny predators probably ate insects and other small animals but were themselves vulnerable to attack by larger meat-eating animals such as other theropods and large monitor lizards. Skeletons of the small plant-eating dinosaur Protoceratops are extremely abundant in Mongolia, in the Gobi. For this reason, when dinosaur eggs and nests were discovered in this area during the 1920s it was assumed that they must have belonged to this animal. During the same series of expeditions, the skeleton of a bizarre theropod was found close to one of these nests, and it was suggested that this animal had died while attempting to steal eggs from the nest. It was given the name Oviraptor, egg thief, as a result. Recent fieldwork in the Gobi has led to the discovery of many more dinosaur nests, some of which are preserved underneath the fossilized skeleton of an Oviraptor. The Oviraptor skeletons appeared to be sitting on top of the eggs, and it was suggested that the nests might belong to Oviraptor rather than to Protoceratops. This idea was proved to be true when an egg containing an Oviraptor embryo was discovered in one of the nests. It seems that Oviraptor was actually a caring parent that brooded its eggs just like a bird, rather than the devious egg thief that it was once thought to be. This is a good example of how new discoveries can overturn long-held views on dinosaur biology and evolution. Dinosaurs interacted with each other, and with the other animals that shared their environment, in an astonishing number of ways. Meat-eating dinosaurs such as Tyrannosaurus and Allosaurus needed the equipment to hunt down and subdue prey animals. They had the teeth and claws to penetrate the superb defenses of plant-eaters such as Triceratops and Iguanodon if they could catch them. Within the same species, individuals would probably have fought each other in contests for mates, food, territory or dominance within a group. To cope with all of these demands, dinosaurs possessed a wide variety of weapons for both attack and defense. The principal weapons of predatory dinosaurs, from the enormous Tyrannosaurus to the diminutive Compsognathus, were mouths lined with rows of blade-like teeth, and hands and feet tipped by razor-sharp claws. The teeth of most theropod dinosaurs were pointed and strongly curved so that they could easily pierce flesh and get a firm grip on a struggling prey animal. Tiny serrations, like those on a steak knife, lined the edges of these teeth, allowing them to slice through meat with ease. In Tyrannosaurus, the teeth were up to 12 inches, 30 centimeters, long and were strong enough to crush and puncture solid bone. Other theropods, such as Baryonyx, had teeth similar to those of living crocodiles that were ideal for impaling slippery prey such as fish. Claws All theropods possessed curved, hook-like claws on their hands and feet. Each claw ended in a sharp point that was ideally suited for digging into the flesh of unfortunate prey animals. During life, a sheath of a hard, horn-like substance called keratin the same material that makes up our hair and fingernails would have covered the bony claws. As the sheath was worn down by use, it would develop a sharp edge, making it a very efficient weapon for cutting and slashing. But the sheath was also a living tissue and could be partially replaced by new growth as it was worn away. The curved shape of the claws, similar to that seen in living birds of prey such as eagles and hawks, would have been useful in pinning prey to the ground when feeding. Some of these claws were enormous. For example, the claws on the hands of Baryonyx would have been over 12 inches, 30 centimeters, long. 
In other cases, the claws were small, but deadly. Several small theropods, such as Deinonychus and Troodon, had specially enlarged claws on their feet that could be used like switchblade knives. A reverse joint in the second toe forced the claw to be folded back during running and walking. However, when attacking, the claw could be flicked forward at high speed. This action could have been performed in combination with a jump or a kick and would have caused a great deal of damage to any animal unlucky enough to be within range. Teeth of Deinonychus are sometimes found alongside skeletons of Tenonosaurus, a large plant-eating dinosaur. Careful study of the shape and size of the teeth by scientists has shown that they often belong to several different individuals. In addition, Deinonychus skeletons are often found together, indicating that these small but vicious hunters lived in groups. These two observations suggest that Deinonychus hunted in packs, using teamwork to attack and kill much larger animals than themselves. The brain of Deinonychus is very large for a dinosaur of its small body size, and this might have allowed it to coordinate its hunting behavior and strategy with other members of the pack. Many plant-eating dinosaurs possessed impressive defensive weapons that provided them with some security in a world populated by large predatory dinosaurs. These weapons ranged from thumb spikes to tail clubs, horns and heavy hoofs. Some dinosaurs were able to rely on sheer size as a defense adult sauropods were so large that they probably weren't threatened by even the largest meat eaters. Others, like the ankylosaurs and the sauropod saltosaurus, relied on coats of armor that could resist the sharp teeth and claws of all but the most determined predators. Stegosaurs possessed pairs of large spikes, up to 2 feet, 60 centimeters, long, situated at the end of a powerful tail. A sideways swipe with this formidable weapon might have severely injured a marauding theropod. Some ankylosaurs might have used massive tail clubs made out of solid bone in a similar way. A few sauropods, including the Chinese omasaurus, omay lizard, also had bony tail clubs. The thick set, heavy tails of large ornithopods, such as Iguanodon and Parasaurolophus, and sauropods might have provided them with some protection. A well-aimed blow from one of these tails could throw an attacker off balance or knock it off its feet. Other sauropods, such as Diplodocus and Apatosaurus, had long, whip-like tails. Powerful muscles could flick the tail from side to side, and the end of the tail could strike a predator at blistering speed. The horns of some Ceratopsian dinosaurs might have been formidable weapons. The arrangement and number of the horns varied from species to species. For example, Triceratops had a short horn on the tip of its nose and a long brow horn over each of the eyes, whereas Monoclineus, one-horned, had a single large horn on its nose. The horns would have been covered with a sharp sheath made of keratin. In Triceratops, a large bony frill over the neck would have provided some protection from predators. Knowing what an animal eats is extremely important. Diet controls almost all aspects of an animal's life, including its behavior and the place where it lives. Animals may be divided into herbivores, plant eaters, carnivores, meat eaters, and omnivores, those that eat both. Direct evidence of dinosaur eating habits is hard to come by. Scientists look for different clues. In rare cases, the remains of the dinosaur's last meal have been found inside the skeleton. We know that the theropod colophysis sometimes practice cannibalism, because scientists have discovered adult skeletons containing small bones of baby colophysis. Another small theropod, Compsognathus, has been found with the remains of a small lizard in its ribcage, close to the original position of the stomach. There is also an example of an Edmontosaurus, a duck-billed dinosaur, with stomach contents that included fragments of bark, pine needles and conifer cones. Examination of fossilized feces, animal waste, called coprolites, can also provide direct evidence of diet. Coprolites contain bits and pieces of the animals or plants that the dinosaur was eating. Unfortunately, there are only a few cases in which a coprolite has been found inside a dinosaur skeleton the direct link that would enable scientists to confidently assign a coprolite to a specific type of dinosaur. In 1991, an expedition from the American Museum of Natural History to Mongolia's desert, the Gobi, made such a find. The coprolite, discovered inside a dromaeosaurid theropod similar to Velociraptor, contained the remains of a small lizard-like animal. Many coprolites have been found that cannot be directly associated with any particular types of dinosaur. Some large coprolites from the Upper Cretaceous period of North America contain several fragments of plant material. Scientists speculate that these may have been produced by hadrosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs that were so abundant at that time. Other coprolites found in the same region contain fragments of bone, demonstrating that meat-eating dinosaurs made them. One recent find, an enormous coprolite over 16 inches, 40 centimeters, long and containing smashed pieces of bone, is thought to have belonged to Tyrannosaurus.
This is the most familiar member of the Stegosauria, a group of dinosaurs that were characterized by a series of bony plates and spines extending along their backs. Although this group existed from the Middle Jurassic period through to the Late Cretaceous period, Stegosaurus is found only in the Late Jurassic rocks of Western North America. It is a large, slow-moving plant-eating dinosaur that lived among, and probably fell prey to, other famous North American dinosaurs of that time, such as Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. Although large, the plates were relatively thin and blunt and would have offered little protection against an attack by one of the large meat-eating theropods. The heavy structure of its legs, its strange curved back and the sheer size of Stegosaurus all suggest that it was not an animal capable of a quick getaway when under attack. As a result, its only defense against fierce Jurassic predators might have been to swing its powerful tail from side to side so that the spikes could be aimed at the delicate legs and belly regions of marauding carnivores. The plates of Stegosaurus might have been used for warning off predators or for recognition between members of a species. But one interesting suggestion is that they functioned as a device for controlling body temperature. Tiny grooves along the plate surfaces indicate the possible presence of numerous blood vessels. These could have served to absorb or discharge body heat. If this were the case, Stegosaurus could probably have controlled the amount of blood passed into the plates to avoid heating up or cooling down at the wrong times. A large dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period in North America, Ankylosaurus was covered from head to tail in sheets of thick bony armor. Large triangular horns projected from the back of its skull. And all along its body, the armor plates were embedded in the skin, with sharp spines sticking up along back and tail. Its tail was thickened at the end into a heavy, bony club. As it shared its habitat with fearsome predators such as Tyrannosaurus and Albertosaurus, it probably needed all this heavy armor. The thick bony plates would have been a good defense against even the most determined theropod. But its underside was unarmored, so, when attacked, Ankylosaurus probably crouched down to protect this vulnerable region. It might have been in danger if a predator could flip it over. But as Ankylosaurus weighed several tons, this would have been difficult to do. Theropods preying upon Ankylosaurus were tall, heavy two-legged animals. As a result, they were slightly less stable than a short four-legged dinosaur. Because of the weight of their bodies, a simple fall could cause them to break some of their bones, especially their slender leg bones. A well-timed blow from the Ankylosaurus tail club could have knocked a predator over or broken one of its legs, resulting in serious injury or even death. Ankylosaurus is one of only two members of the family Ankylosauridae known from North America. All other Ankylosaurids lived in Eastern Asia. It appears that the group first evolved in Asia, at some time in the earliest Cretaceous period, when Eastern Asia and North America were connected by a land bridge. The ancestors of Ankylosaurus probably crossed into North America from Asia using this route. Pachycephalosaurus was a plant-eating dinosaur that roamed western North America in the late Cretaceous period. It is notable for the huge dome on top of its head that was up to 10 inches, 25 centimeters, thick. The function of this dome is uncertain, and has been the subject of considerable argument among experts ever since the first remains of the dinosaur were discovered in 1940. The dome might have acted like a dinosaur crash helmet to shield the head during attack. But, unlike armored dinosaurs such as Ankylosaurs, the rest of the body is not protected. So protecting only the head would be of little use against the jaws of Tyrannosaurus or other meat-eating dinosaur. Another theory is that the dome might have enabled Pachycephalosaurus to recognize one another. Each species of Pachycephalosaurus had a differently shaped dome. Yet another possibility is that the chief use of the dome was as a weapon against predators and in fights with other Pachycephalosaurus. If two males rammed into each other at high speed, Shockwaves caused by a head but could be carried through the skull, down the specially strengthened backbone and through the hind limbs to the ground. However, some experts argue that Pachycephalosaurus would not have butted their heads together, because the bone forming the dome does not itself appear to be very strong. Instead, they suggest, two males might have pushed direct combat is not the only kind of confrontation. Some Pachycephalosaurs had spikes projecting down and back behind the head. When the head was lowered, the spikes might have presented a large, formidable display to a rival much as moose antlers do. Existing alongside Pachycephalosaurus were the stout, heavily armored ankylosaurs and the trumpet-headed Parasaurolophus. All of these plant-eating dinosaurs probably fell prey to the giant meat-eaters of the time such as Albertosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex.
The remains of Protoceratops were discovered in Mongolia's desert, the Gobi, by an expedition from the American Museum of Natural History in New York during the 1920s. It is one of the earliest known members of the group that contains the horned dinosaurs, such as Triceratops. The name Protoceratops is rather misleading, as it has no real horns on its skull merely low bumps of bone on the top of its nose and on its cheeks. But the bony neck frill and parrot-like beak show that it belonged to the same group as the other horned dinosaurs. Protoceratops is more primitive than the other much bigger horned dinosaurs. Its body was barrel-shaped and probably looked a little like that of a large pig. However, unlike a pig, the body was strongly arched at the hips. Because of this, the long, deep tail might have drooped downward from the rear of its body. The hind limbs were strong and straight, with large feet. One reconstruction suggested that the front limbs were sprawled out to the sides, rather like a modern reptile, giving Protoceratops a crouched appearance. But most evidence now indicates that the front limbs were held under the body just like the hind limbs. This arrangement would have supported the head well above ground level. Scientists have discovered the skeletons of baby, juvenile and adult Protoceratops, enabling them to work out the details of their growth. As young Protoceratops grew, their faces became deeper and shorter, their mouths wider, and their bony neck frills wider and taller. The wide rib cage housed a big stomach that was used to digest large amounts of plant food. Because of its slight resemblance to pigs, some scientists have suggested that Protoceratops might have lived a little like them by rooting and grubbing around in the soil for roots, tubers and other nutritious plants. It, it might have behaved like this, but its impressive set of grinding teeth and its parrot-like beak indicate that it could probably chop up much tougher foodstuffs than pigs do. The powerful, stocky build and strong beak of Protoceratops made it a formidable defender of its eggs and young. One remarkable fossil shows the preserved remains of a Protoceratops and a Velociraptor, a theropod dinosaur, entangled together. It appears that these two dinosaurs died in combat as they were overcome by slumping sand dunes. Many eggs and nests first thought to belong to Protoceratops have been unearthed in Mongolia. But most of these nests are now known to have belonged to the theropod Oviraptor. This was the largest and in some ways the most unusual, of the magnificent horned dinosaurs of the late Cretaceous period. No complete skeletons of Triceratops have ever been unearthed. However, the discovery of numerous skulls, horns, and teeth indicate that it was one of the most common dinosaurs of this time. The skull of Triceratops had three prominent horns one short horn on the nose and two long horns above the eyes. Its impressive bony neck frill could reach up to 6 feet 6 inches, 2 meters, in width, extending outward from the back of the skull, covering the neck. The snout formed a curved, parrot-like beak that was tipped with a horn. This imposing head was as much as 5 feet, 1.5 meters, across one of the largest skulls known in any land animal. Long ago, it was proposed that the frill protected the neck of Triceratops against the attacks of big meat-eating dinosaurs such as Tyrannosaurus rex. This might have been true some of the time, but a number of frills have been found with Tyrannosaurus bite marks puncturing them. Another idea is that the frill might have been used for display during contests for mates, territory, or social position within the group. It is likely, as with other Ceratopsians, the frill allowed members of the same species to recognize each other. Another intriguing idea is that the frill was used to regulate body temperature. Triceratops had a stout, barrel-shaped body and powerful limbs that were much more strongly built than those of living elephants. The limbs were probably this strong to withstand the weight of the animal as it ran. But its large size probably meant Triceratops could not run very fast. In addition, the front limbs needed to be very strong to help support the weight of that enormous head. Triceratops looks a little like the dinosaur equivalent of a rhinoceros. It might have behaved in quite a similar way, spending most of its time eating plants and occasionally defending itself with its horns when threatened. The jaws of Triceratops were lined with dozens of closely packed teeth that formed dental batteries similar to those of the duck-billed dinosaurs. The jaws had a powerful scissor-like action, and the rows of teeth formed elongated, cutting blades that were ideal for shredding tough plants into short pieces. Hypsilophodon was one of the smallest dinosaurs, reaching only six and a half feet, two meters, in length when fully grown. It was a slender plant eater whose head was no bigger than a child's hand. Its jaws were lined with a set of ridged, leaf-shaped teeth that were used for slicing through leaves and other parts of plants. In addition to a set of good cutting teeth, Hypsilophodon also had a turtle-like beak, made of horn, at the front of its snout. 
This was useful in nipping the shoots and leaves off juicy plants. Most reptiles lack cheeks, but Hypsilophodon like most other ornithischians might have had fleshy cheeks that helped to keep food in its mouth while chewing. Large holes at the back of the skull provided plenty of room for the attachment of powerful muscles that worked the jaws. The leg bones of Hypsilophodon were long, slender and lightweight. Its long hind legs had big thigh muscles, which helped it to run and dodge speedily. These muscles might have made its legs look a bit like smaller versions of the legs of some of the big flightless birds alive today, such as ostriches of Africa and emus of Australia. Hypsilophodon stood with its body slung quite close to the ground and was well balanced at the hips, with a good build for twisting and turning to escape its enemies. Another aid to sharp maneuvering was its long, powerful tail muscles, which drew the hind legs back into running. All of these features suggest that Hypsilophodon was a speedy little runner. It might have had a way of life a little like some of the very small antelope in Africa today, such as gazelles, which cat delicate shoots and leaves and escape from their attackers by running very fast. When scientists first examined the foot bones of Hypsilophodon, they thought that they were similar to those of perching birds with opposable toes. As a result, Early reconstructions of Hypsilophodon often show it perched up on the branches of a tree. Scientists have rejected this idea, as later studies of the foot bones showed that the toes could not have been used to clamp the feet onto branches so climbing would have been impossible. One of the hadrosaurs, or duck-billed dinosaurs, Myasaura possessed the flattened, toothless beak at the front of the snout that characterized this group. It lived and nested along the shores of an ancient sea that stretched across the center of North America during the Cretaceous period. The discovery of large numbers of Myasaura fossils, many of which represent animals at different stages of life, and of their fossilized nesting grounds has enabled scientists to study the family behavior and growth rates of these dinosaurs. Myasaura was first discovered in 1978, when 15 babies and a fossilized nest were uncovered in Montana. These animals were about 3 feet, 1 meter, in length and had been approximately 4 weeks old when they died. Despite their age, the hip bones and the backbone were not fused together tightly, and the ends of the limbs had not turned completely to bone. This means that they were not able to walk properly. But their teeth were well worn, which suggests they had been feeding on plant matter for some time. Food must have been brought to the nest by the parents, and the babies cared for in the nest for some period of time. Since these early discoveries, Many more Myasaura fossils have been found, and scientists have identified distinct growth stages in the life of a developing Myasaura. When newly hatched, the young were just under 20 inches 50 centimeters, long. They remained in the nest for one to two months, and at this stage were growing very fast. They continued to grow rapidly until they were between one and two years old and over 10 feet 3 meters, long. After the age of two, Growth appeared to slow down, and Myasaura reached adulthood at about 7 to 8 years. At this point, they may have been up to 23 feet, 7 meters long. This growth rate is faster than any living reptile and similar to that of living, warm-blooded birds and mammals. This evidence strongly suggests that Myasaura, like other large dinosaurs, were warm-blooded. Some Myasaura fossils are found in bone beds fossil deposits composed of the remains of hundreds of individuals. Some of these cover areas many miles wide. The animals in these bone beds might have died suddenly and been covered by ashes from a nearby volcanic eruption. The large number of skeletons in these bone beds provide strong support for the idea that Myasaura nested in colonies. In comparison with the giant sauropods of the Jurassic, period, Plateosaurus was a medium-sized animal. But during the late Triassic it was one of the largest dinosaurs on Earth, and one of the first really big dinosaurs. Plateosaurus was a member of the Prosauropoda, a small group of dinosaurs closely related to the later sauropods. Prosauropods flourished during the late Triassic, but they became extinct at the end of the early Jurassic period. In the early 1800s, more than 100 skeletons of a large extinct reptile were discovered in a single quarry in central Germany. They were very well preserved, and 10 complete skulls were recovered. These fossils were named Plateosaurus by the German scientist Hermann von Meyer in 1837. This preceded the invention of the term dinosaur by five years, and it was not until some time later that Plateosaurus was recognized as a dinosaur. 
Like other prosauropods, Plateosaurus had a long neck, a small head, and an elongated, barrel-like body. Its limbs and tail would have been equipped with powerful muscles. The hind limbs were very long, and it appears that Plateosaurus was capable of walking bipedally. It would also have been able to rear up onto its hind legs. In combination with the long neck, this would have allowed Plateosaurus to feed on branches 10 to 13 feet, 3 to 4 m, above ground level. Its arms were quite short, but its broad hands would have been able to support a lot of weight. This suggests that Plateosaurus usually chose to walk on all fours. Plateosaurus is usually thought of as a plant-eating dinosaur. But large claws on its thumb and on the second toe of the foot have led some scientists to suggest that it might occasionally have eaten meat. Its teeth show a combination of features that would have been useful in both chopping up plant food and catching small prey. Plateosaurus might have used its claws for tearing up roots, the carcasses of dead animals, and insect mounds. The claws could also have been used to defend against attack from large predators. Brachiosaurus was once thought to be the largest dinosaur of all. Some scientists estimated that it weighed as much as 80 tons, making it heavier than the combined weight of 20 adult elephants. Most scientists now accept a figure of about 50 tons still much heavier than any land animal alive today. The name Brachiosaurus refers to the very long arms of this sauropod. Brachiosaurus was the only dinosaur with arms that were much longer than its hind. Limbs, a feature that raised the chest and shoulder region of this animal to perhaps 8 feet, 2.5 meters, above ground level. However, these long limbs were surprisingly slim not strong enough for Brachiosaurus to run or even to walk too quickly. The long arms might have been useful in stepping over large obstacles, or they could have been an adaptation for feeding on tall trees. The neck also contributed to this high-level feeding strategy. It was made up of 12 individual vertebrae, each of which could be over 28 inches 70 centimeters long. This gave the neck a total length of about 30 feet 9 meters. Add this to the height of the shoulders, and it would be reasonable to suggest that Brachiosaurus could reach plants up to 36 feet 11 meters above ground level while standing on all fours. Few other sauropods could reach these levels, so Brachiosaurus was able to feed with little disturbance. When Brachiosaurus held its neck upright, it would have been very difficult for the heart to pump blood all the way up to the brain, unless there was some way to boost circulation. This problem could have been solved in several ways. The heart might have been capable of keeping the blood pressure very high, so that blood could always reach the brain. But then, when Brachiosaurus bent down to drink, the high blood pressure could cause many of the fragile blood vessels in the brain to burst. Giraffe solved this problem with elastic, muscular arteries that keep blood flowing, and a protective network of capillaries behind the brain to prevent blood from flooding it when the head is lowered. Did the problem of pumping blood to the head prevent Brachiosaurus from raising its head above shoulder height? If this were the case, why should Brachiosaurus and the other sauropods have developed such long necks? The vertebrae of all advanced sauropod dinosaurs had holes in their sides known as pleuroceles. These often became so large that the vertebrae were reduced to a honeycomb structure of struts and bars. These were filled with air sacs that made the vertebrae very light but strong enough to support the animal's weight. Diplodocus is one of the most familiar of all dinosaurs, but in some ways it is highly unusual. Although it has the long neck, tiny head and huge body seen in all other sauropods, it differs from its relatives in several respects. The most important differences are found in the way that Diplodocus used its teeth, jaws and neck to reach, and eat, a wide variety of plant foods. The teeth of Diplodocus are tall, slim and pencil-like. Rather than running for the entire length of the jaws, they are confined to the front of the mouth, where they form a comb-like or rake-like arrangement. Such teeth are unsuitable for chewing tough plant food, and the wear on their tips suggests they cannot have been locked together to cut through leaves and stems. These features have caused some debate among scientists. Some thought that the teeth could be used to pull bark from trees, others that the rake-like arrangement might have been useful in straining weeds or mussels from ponds and rivers. It is now known, however, that the teeth were used to rake leaves and fruits from the branches of trees and shrubs. They could also have been used to pluck ferns and horsetails from closer to ground level. Until recently, 
it was thought that the long neck of Diplodocus meant that it ate leaves from the tops of trees and rarely ate food at lower levels. But computer modeling and detailed studies of the individual neck bones have shown that the neck could move in a number of different ways. It seems that most of the time when Diplodocus was walking or standing at rest, for example the neck was held horizontally. It could be lifted up to reach the treetops, but it is likely that Diplodocus could not have held the neck in this position for long periods of time. Special joints between the neck bones allowed the neck to be moved from side to side as well as up and down. This flexible neck would have allowed Diplodocus to feed on food from a variety of heights above ground level. Another clue that suggests Diplodocus sometimes fed on low-growing vegetation comes from its forelimbs. The front legs are very short for an animal of this kind, and as a result, the front of the body, including the head, is held closer to the ground. Diplodocus might have used its tail as a powerful weapon against marauding meat-eaters, such as Allosaurus. The end of the tail is very thin and could be swung from side to side at great speed by massive muscles at the front end of the tail. This whiplash could be flicked at predators and would strike a severe blow. Some scientists have suggested that the tail moved so fast that it even sounded like a cracking whip. Baryonyx was discovered in 1983 in a quarry in southern England. It was a surprising and important find, as paleontologists had collected fossils from these rocks for many years but had not found any evidence of this dinosaur before. In addition, Baryonyx is very different in shape from most other meat-eating dinosaurs and had a very different diet. The skull of Baryonyx is very long, low and narrow. The nostrils, instead of being at the tip of the skull as they are in most other theropods, are placed about 4 inches, 10 centimeters, back along the snout. The teeth are wider, with finer serrations, than the blade-like steak knife teeth of other meat-eaters, making them more efficient stabbers than slashers. At the ends of the jaws, the teeth are larger in size and stand out from the bone in a circular rosette pattern. These types of skull adaptations can be seen in the modern fish cating crocodilian, the gavial of southern Asia, and strongly suggest that baryonyx lived on a diet of fish. The teeth of baryonyx could pierce soft flesh, and their rosette structure helped it grip and hold slippery fish. As its nostrils were placed farther back, it could hold its snout in water and breathe at the same time. The arms are very strong and end in large claws used to hook fish out of the water. Complete with horny sheath, the biggest claw is nearly 1 foot, 0.3 meters, long. Baryonyx lived during a time when the south of what is now England enjoyed a subtropical climate. It lived on a large river delta, or floodplain, very close to the sea. Large fish, some of which reached as much as 10 feet, 3 meters, in length, inhabited these waters. The partly digested remains of some of these fish, including scales and teeth were found preserved in the stomach region of Baryonyx as the fossil was excavated. Some features of the hand and skull suggest that Baryonyx was also a scavenger that is, it fed on dead animals. Its strong arms and claws might have been used to rip open carcasses, and the position of its nostrils would have enabled it to feed with its snout deep inside a carcass, while still being able to breathe. Remains of a young iguanodon were also found close to the belly region of Baryonyx, supporting the idea that it ate not only fish but other animals too. Carnotaurus shares some characteristics with dinosaurs from the northern hemisphere, such as the sharp, narrow curved teeth seen in all other meat-eating theropods. It has very short arm bones, similar to those of the tyrannosaurs from North America and Asia. In contrast, other features, such as the horns, are unique to Carnotaurus. The horns are made from bone and extend upward and outward from the rear corners of the skull. Other large theropods such as Allosaurus can have bony prominences over the eyes, but not as large as in Carnotaurus. The horns might have been used for display. But, as so few Carnotaurus skeletons have been discovered, we do not know whether only the males had horns or whether females also had them. The snout of Carnotaurus is very narrow, but beneath the horns the skull gets much wider, with eyes facing forward slightly. As a result, Carnotaurus might have had binocular vision, in which the fields of vision of the left and right eye are able to cross. This is also a feature of human eyesight, and enables an animal to estimate distances accurately. And its agile build suggests that Carnotaurus could chase down prey. But what did Carnotaurus cat? 
Most dinosaurs with short arms, such as the tyrannosaurs, have very strong, enlarged heads that served as the main killing machine. But, because of its shape and flexibility, the skull of Carnotaurus was quite weak. It could have got twisted and bent, particularly in struggles with large animals. This suggests that Carnotaurus did not often attack animals of the same size or larger than itself, as its skull could not withstand such forces. Instead, it might have preyed upon smaller, more agile animals, using its specialist vision and bursts of high speed running to catch them. Allosaurus was the top predatory dinosaur of the late Jurassic period in North America. It is one of the most scientifically important of all theropod dinosaurs because experts know much more about its anatomy, appearance and lifestyle than any other large meat-eating dinosaur. Allosaurus is best known from finds in the western United States. It was named by Othniel Marsh in 1877 on the basis of an incomplete skeleton from Colorado. Additional remains of Allosaurus have been discovered in South Dakota, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, and New Mexico. Many complete skeletons, several complete skulls and hundreds of individual bones are now known. One of the most spectacular finds was made at a site in Utah, where hundreds of Allosaurus bones were found mixed with the bones of the sauropods Camarasaurus and Apatosaurus. Like almost all other theropods, Allosaurus was a flesh eater. The commonest North American dinosaurs at this time were the gigantic plant-eating sauropods. Allosaurus was not big enough to threaten adult sauropods, but could probably prey upon those that were young, sick, or very old. The large size of Allosaurus suggests that it was not a particularly fast runner, but speed was not necessary to hunt sauropods, as they were very slow-moving animals. Smaller plant-eating dinosaurs, such as Camptosaurus and Stegosaurus, would have formed an important part of an Allosaurus diet, and small theropods, lizards, and mammals might also have been taken. As Allosaurus could not outrun any of these creatures, it probably lay in ambush, waiting for unsuspecting prey to pass by. Allosaurus might also have eaten the carcasses of dead animals. One of the most distinctive features of Allosaurus is the presence of a ridge of bone, or crest, just in front of catch eye. In some skulls, these crests are large and pointed, whereas in others they are smaller and rounded. The function of the crests is not known, but some experts have suggested that the differences in crest size and shape might reflect the different sexes of the animals. An Allosaurus with large pointed crests might have been male, one with smaller crests female, or vice versa. Alternatively, the crests might have had a special function, such as housing glands near to the eye. When the first reasonably complete skeleton of Tyrannosaurus was uncovered in 1902, scientists realized they had discovered one of the most important and one of the most fearsome dinosaurs yet known. Its huge head was over 5 feet, 1.5 meters, in length, and its large teeth were razor-sharp conical spikes up to 8 inches, 20 centimeters, long. For nearly a hundred years, we regarded Tyrannosaurus as the largest meat-eating animal ever known. But carnivorous dinosaurs discovered recently in South America and Africa have proved to be even larger. In contrast to the relatively light skull of animals such as Allosaurus, the skull of Tyrannosaurus is made of thick, heavy bone. The back of the head is very wide, providing space for large jaw-closing muscles. Most of the teeth are much wider than those of other meat-eaters and are serrated along the front and back edges. But teeth at the front of the snout are narrower. Thanks to the distinctive nature of the teeth, paleontologists have been able to identify Tyrannosaurus bite marks on a number of fossil bones that belonged to herbivorous dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus teeth functioned less like the slashing weapons of Allosaurus and more like large spikes, used to pierce and grip food. Powerful neck muscles aided the ripping away of large chunks of meat from its prey. Bones of the herbivorous dinosaur Edmontosaurus have been found covered in deep gashes created during this puncture and pull method of feeding. The narrow front teeth were probably used to reach into awkward gaps and tug out pieces of flesh. Other evidence tells us that Tyrannosaurus was able to crush and break bone. A Triceratops hip bone, covered in Tyrannosaurus bite marks, has had a large chunk removed it was probably bitten away. And fossilized Tyrannosaurus dung was found to be full of the broken bones of a young Edmontosaurus. A recent study has shown that the bite of a Tyrannosaurus was three times as powerful as the bite of a lion. Aided by its keen sense of smell, 
Tyrannosaurus also perhaps scavenged from the bones of animals that were already dead. Being the largest predator of its time, it was able to scare away other feeding animals and dine on its stolen prey in peace, unless disturbed by another, larger Tyrannosaurus. Velociraptor gave its nickname to the vicious predators in Jurassic Park that were called raptors. In fact, those movie dinosaurs were closer in size to Deinonychus. And the term raptor is normally used by ornithologists to describe eagles, hawks and their relatives, which swoop down on their prey and grab them with their sharp, curved talons. Velociraptor was closely related to Deinonychus and had many of the same features notably, the enormous second claw of the foot that made it such a formidable weapon. Like Deinonychus, it also had a long tail that was reinforced along its length by an unusual feature. The bony arches above and below the central column of tail bones were flattened and elongated into thin rods that extended forward and backward along many vertebrae. These rods formed bundles above and below each side of the central column of tail bones. They supported the tail and held it straight but also had some flexibility. As a result, the muscles of the tail could be reduced, whereas in most reptiles they are large to help pull back the legs in walking and running. Here, the tail was more independent of the legs. Another interesting feature of Deinonychus, Velociraptor, and their relatives was an unusual joint in the wrist. In most animals, the wrists hinge up and down because, like the foot bones, the hand bones are used in walking. But in these bipeds, the wrists were also able to move from side to side, in the same way that a bird can flex its wrists. This is not surprising, because these animals are the closest known relatives of the first birds. The sideways motion of these long hands, which helped Velociraptor and its relatives trap prey, was later used by birds as an important part of the flight stroke. Of all the features that made Velociraptor such an efficient killer, the most important was the sharply curved claw on the second toe. When Velociraptor was walking, its claws were pulled back and held clear of the ground to prevent them becoming blunt. When Velociraptor attacked, a claw could be flicked forward and downward by kicking out powerfully with one leg. In this way, the claw worked like a switchblade knife. It could cut a long wound in the prey, which would probably then bleed to death. Archaeopteryx is recognized as the earliest known bird. It existed during the late Jurassic period in Germany. It is one of the most scientifically interesting fossils because it gives important evidence supporting the theory that birds evolved from a dinosaur ancestor. The unusual mixture of bird-like and reptile-like features in Archaeopteryx has led scientists to the conclusion that it was a missing link between dinosaurs and birds. The first evidence of this ancient bird was found in the limestone quarries about the small town of Sonhofen, in southern Germany. A single feather was found in 1860 by quarrymen and named by scientists in 1861. Archaeopteryx is now known from seven skeletons of which five are almost complete. Some of these skeletons have fossilized impressions of feathers about the wing bones. This feature helped scientists to recognize that Archaeopteryx was a bird other features of the skeleton were more similar to those of theropods. Because all eight specimens of Archaeopteryx come from the same place, many scientists have studied the Sonhofen limestones to discover something about the habitat that it lived in. It seems to have flown through the skies above a salty lagoon that was separated from warm tropical seas by a coral reef. Unlike modern birds, which have a horny beak and no teeth, Archaeopteryx had long, slim jaws lined with sharp teeth that curved slightly backward. It was about the same size as a modern magpic, so it probably fed in a similar way and ate almost anything that was small enough to be swallowed. Insects probably made up much of its diet. But although Archaeopteryx lived close to the sea, it is unlikely that it ate fish. There are two main reasons for this. First, the lagoon was too salty for fish to live in. And second, the sea beyond the reef was too rough to allow Archaeopteryx to swoop down and catch fish swimming beneath the surface. An unusual feature of Archaeopteryx is the presence of a bird-like wishbone. In living birds, the wishbone is made from the joined-up collarbones that lie across the upper part of the chest. In birds, this is an important area for the attachment of the strong muscles that power the wings. Many theropod dinosaurs, including oviraptorids, velociraptors, allosaurs and even tyrannosaurs, also had a wishbone which was probably used for the attachment of powerful arm muscles. Other features of Archaeopteryx, besides its teeth and wishbone, show its intermediate status between typical theropods and living birds. It has a long bony tail with feathers along the sides. 
The bones of its hands and feet are not fused together as they are in living birds. And its three fingers, identical to those of other theropods, are also separate, not fused as in today's birds. The theropod dinosaur Carcharodontosaurus was unlucky enough to suffer two extinctions. After its natural demise sometime in the late Cretaceous period, some fossil remains were destroyed during a bombing raid on a German museum in World War II. Luckily, recent expeditions to Northern Africa have uncovered exciting new Carcharodontosaurus material. These latest discoveries reveal that it was one of the largest land-based predators ever to walk the earth. Where the Sahara now stretches across Northern Africa, a lush, green environment once existed during late Cretaceous times. Carcharodontosaurus could be found along the banks of large rivers, searching the land for its next meal. Its skull is even longer than that of the huge North American theropod Tyrannosaurus rex. Another enormous theropod, Gigantosaurus from South America, was similar in size to Carcharodontosaurus. These two animals are closely related, and it seems that large body size evolved in a common ancestor. But large body size evolved independently in the more distantly related Tyrannosaurus. All of these animals were the top predators in their environments, able to catch the largest prey and to feast on the kills of others. They used their sheer size to scare away all other competitors for food. Thanks to the unique shape of its teeth, the remains of Carcharodontosaurus can easily be recognized, even when there are only fragments of skeleton. The telltale signs are little grooves running from the characteristic theropod serrations across the surface of the tooth. They were created from wrinkles in the tooth enamel. These wrinkles sometimes stretch across the whole tooth. A medium to large horned dinosaur, Chasmosaurus had one of the longest skulls of any known land living animal. The skull reached over six and a half feet, 2m, in length and made up about a quarter of the entire length of the animal's body. There is a great deal of variation in the arrangement of the horns and in the orientation of the frill in the different species of the plant-eating Chasmosaurus. Finds of bone beds with many Chasmosaurus individuals together suggest they lived in herds. All species of Chasmosaurus had a small nose horn and two brow horns, but the sizes of the brow horns differed considerably. Some species had very small brow horns that were no more than pointed bumps of bone above the eyes. Others had much longer brow horns, though none of these horns was as impressive as those of other horned dinosaurs, such as Triceratops. In all species of Chasmosaurus, the frill was a broad shield-like structure that lacked the impressive spikes seen in animals such as Styracosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus. But one or two small spines might sometimes have been present at the corners of the frill. The advanced horned dinosaurs, called ceratopsids, can be divided into two groups. Chasmosaurs, such as Chasmosaurus, had very long frills, whereas Centrosaurs, such as Pachyrhinosaurus, had much shorter frills. Although all ceratopsians are often referred to collectively as horned dinosaurs, only the ceratopsids possessed large horns. All scientists agree that the hind legs of horned dinosaurs were held straight beneath the body, like pillars. But there has been some debate about the way in which the front legs were held. Some scientists think that the legs were held out sideways, in a similar fashion to that seen in lizards and crocodiles. However, if this were the case, it is difficult to see how Chasmosaurus and its relatives could have supported the massive weight of their huge, horned heads. It seems more likely that the front limbs were also held straight beneath the body, as this would have made carrying the head much easier. Some evidence from trackways supports this view. If the front legs were held out to the sides, the trackways of horned dinosaurs would be very wide. However, the trackways are actually very narrow, showing that the limbs must have been held directly underneath the body. The fossil remains of ceratopsians are known only from Central Asia and North America. The most primitive ceratopsians, such as Cetacosaurus, lived in China and Mongolia during the early Cretaceous period, suggesting that the group first evolved in Asia. Chasmosaurus has been found in large bone beds in Alberta, Canada. Some bone beds contain the remains from tens, or even hundreds, of individuals of Chasmosaurus. Bone beds are formed extremely rapidly by a single catastrophic event, such as the flooding of a river or the eruption of a volcano. Study of the Chasmosaurus bone beds has shown that they were formed during a flood, suggesting that an entire herd of these animals perished as they tried to swim across a river. 
similar events are known to occur today. As herds of wildebeest migrate across the African plains, they often have to cross large rivers. If the river is in flood, many wildebeests drown and are washed downriver, where their bodies accumulate in large piles. The Chasmosaurus bone beds may be telling us that this horned dinosaur also migrated over large distances, but this idea is difficult to prove. This was a two-legged, meat-eating dinosaur from the late Jurassic period of North America. It is marked by a single small horn situated on the top of its snout, just behind the nostrils. Fossils of Ceratosaurus are sometimes found alongside those of another large theropod dinosaur, Allosaurus. But, although these two animals share the same environment, Ceratosaurus was a much rarer inhabitant of this late Jurassic North American landscape. It is unusual to find two large predatory animals in the same environment. Such a discovery suggests that each animal had a slightly different feeding strategy. Whereas Allosaurus could be up to 45 feet, 14 meters, in length, Ceratosaurus reached no more than 20 feet, 6 meters. So perhaps Allosaurus tackled larger prey, such as Stegosaurus and the sauropods Diplodocus and Apatosaurus. The abundance of Allosaurus fossils also suggests that this animal may have been a group hunter. In contrast, Ceratosaurus could prey upon small ornithopods and other smaller reptiles. Ceratosaurus fossils are rather rare, suggesting that it was a lone hunter. The body of Ceratosaurus was supported by large pillar-like hind limbs. Its forelimbs, although shorter, were robust and strong. They would have been useful tools during prey capture and feeding. The head is large, and balanced by a long, heavy tail. But the skull is not particularly strong. And the neck is quite short and stout for a meat-eating theropod. Although the skeletons of Ceratosaurus and Allosaurus look quite similar, Ceratosaurus has four fingers on its hand, as opposed to the three fingers of Allosaurus. This feature, among others, shows that these two dinosaurs are not particularly closely related. Camarasaurus was the most abundant dinosaur in North America during the late Jurassic period. Herds of these animals roam through the open conifer forests that cover the western United States at this time. Although Camarasaurus reached a length of about 66 feet, 20 meters, it is actually one of the smaller sauropod dinosaurs. Its relatively small size and abundance probably made it a target for large predators such as Allosaurus. Most species of sauropod dinosaur are known from only one or two skeletons, and even these may be damaged or have many missing parts. The skulls of these huge animals are particularly rare, and only a few complete skulls have ever been discovered. Camarasaurus, however, is one of the few sauropods for which scientists have a large number of good skeletons and several skulls in good condition. As a result, scientists know a great deal about the anatomy of Camarasaurus. Skeletons from all age groups are known, from babies up to fully grown adults. It used to be thought that sauropods did not chew their food very much, but just used their teeth to nip off leaves and fruits before allowing their very long guts to do all of the hard work involved in digestion. However, detailed studies on the teeth and jaws have shown that Camarasaurus could have chewed its food at least somewhat. The teeth are broad and robust, and they locked together as the jaws were closed. This allowed Camarasaurus to make short work of even the toughest plants. To many, it seems remarkable that the small heads of sauropods could have eaten enough food to maintain their size and growth. The neck of Camarasaurus is relatively short by sauropod standards. It is made up of 12 individual neck bones, or vertebrae. These were connected to each other by large ball and socket joints at the bottom, and by smaller peg-like joints at the top. About 225 million years ago, in what is now a remote region of Argentina, South America, a new group of animals began to evolve. These were the dinosaurs, and their presence on Earth would change the face of the planet forever. Eoraptor is not the ancestor of all other dinosaurs, but it may be a very primitive dinosaur or a very close relative of dinosaurs. Its remains help scientists to work out how dinosaurs first evolved. Eoraptor was discovered only in 1993 by a team of American and Argentinian paleontologists. It was a small, bipedal, two-legged, meat-eating animal. It possessed certain dinosaurian characteristics, such as modifications of the ankle, hind legs and hip. These features enabled dinosaurs to stand with their legs directly beneath their bodies. On the other hand, it lacks some dinosaurian features, such as the structures of the skull, wrist, hand and pelvis. Along the jaws, curved and serrated theropod-like teeth sit side by side with more leaf-shaped teeth, like those seen in the most primitive prosauropods. Hollow limb bones and elongated hands ending in curved, 
grasping and raking claws seem to place Eoraptor within the theropods. However, lack of a flexible hinge in the lower jaw suggests that Eoraptor is at the very bottom of the theropod family tree or perhaps not a theropod at all. The anatomy of Eoraptor suggests that dinosaurs evolved from a small, bipedal, carnivorous reptile, at some time in the Middle Triassic period. This dinosaur, a four-legged plant eater, might have been the largest armored animal of all time. The fossil bones of Saltosaurus were found in the remote Salta region of Argentina. Saltosaurus was not very big for a sauropod, being less than half the length of a patasaurus. It was an extremely rare sauropod. It had a series of small lumpy bones on its back that served it well as a suit of armor, a feature seen in only a few other sauropod species. Saltosaurus might have been rare, but it was a pretty typical sauropod dinosaur in most respects. As with all sauropods, it had a bulky body, an extremely long tail and a long neck. Saltosaurus belongs to a group of sauropods called the Titanosaurids. It was one of the very last sauropods to exist. It lived during the last few million years of the age of the dinosaurs. Almost all of the sauropods from the late Cretaceous period are Titanosaurids that were closely related to Saltosaurus. The fossil remains of many Titanosaurids are rather fragmentary, and this makes them difficult to study. Indeed, most Titanosaurid species are known from only one or two partial skeletons, and no complete skull of any Titanosaurid has ever been discovered. A few isolated skull bones tell us that the skulls of Titanosaurids were short and compact, and a little like that of Camarasaurus. All Titanosaurids had long, peg-shaped teeth, similar to those of Diplodocus. These were used to strip branches of their leaves and to nip off small fruits and pine cones. The necks of Titanosaurids were slightly broader. Because of these features, Saltosaurus and other Titanosaurids could not rear up on their hind legs to reach high into the trees like Diplodocus. But its long neck probably gave Saltosaurus a maximum reach of about 20 feet, 6 meters, above ground level still pretty high. The armor of Saltosaurus consisted of large oval plates of bone up to about 8 inches, 20 centimeters, across the size of a small dinner plate. The surface of the plates was covered with many low ridges and pitted with numerous small holes. These plates would have been embedded in the skin and would have made Saltosaurus a very unattractive meal for a predator. Some other Titanosaurids are also known to have had armor plate. The biggest claws of any animal that has ever lived belonged to the mysterious Therizinosaurus. Its name refers to the gigantic, sickle-shaped claws found on the hand. The best specimen of this animal consists of an enormous arm and shoulder blade that were found in rocks in the desert of central Mongolia, the Gobi. The limited number of remains available to scientists makes deduction of this animal's behavior extremely difficult. The first claws of Therizinosaurus were discovered in 1948 by a joint Russian-Mongolian scientific expedition. Initially, they were thought to be the remains of a huge turtle. But later finds included several teeth, incomplete forelimbs, a large claw, a few fragments of hind limbs and a distinctive four-toed foot. These specimens showed that the mighty claws were actually those of a dinosaur. The question of what type of dinosaur was more difficult, and this matter was debated among scientists for many years. Eventually, in the 1990s, it was decided that Therizinosaurus was a theropod dinosaur. But it was so unlike any other theropod that it was put into a group of its own. Most theropod dinosaurs had relatively small claws on their hands, and their arms were not usually very powerful. But the claws of Therizinosaurus were about a quarter the length of the arm 2 foot 0.6 m, claws on an 8 foot 2.5 m arm. The bones of the arm are massive, and show lumps and scars where extremely powerful muscles would have been attached. There appears to have been a mighty set of shoulder muscles, too. As a result, this monster must have possessed a huge pair of muscular arms. As scientists have so few bones of Therizinosaurus, its overall appearance is much more of a mystery. Some scientists think that it looked a bit like the early prosauropod dinosaur Platyosaurus, with a medium-length neck and a small head. Others think that it had shorter hind limbs and a shorter tail. These features would have caused Therizinosaurus to adopt a strange posture when standing it would have looked as if it were sitting down with its back held very straight, even though it was standing up. Many of the bones of Therizinosaurus look very similar to those of two other dinosaurs that were found in rocks of about the same geological age in the same region of Mongolia. These dinosaurs are Segnosaurus and Erlikosaurus, 
and all three of these animals appear to be very closely related to each other. A well-preserved skull of Ehrlichosaurus gives some useful clues to the lifestyle of Therizinosaurus. Ehrlichosaurus had a long, low, lightweight skull with a horny beak at the front of the snout. The small, leaf-shaped teeth show that this animal was mainly herbivorous, though it might have preyed occasionally on small lizards and mammals. Therizinosaurus probably had a similar diet, despite its massive claws. The claws might have been used to grasp onto plants. Plant cating is extremely rare among theropods, adding yet another unusual feature to our understanding of this bizarre animal. The late Cretaceous dinosaur Troodon appears to have led a double life. On the one hand, it was a fierce meat-eater, adequately equipped to terrorize small reptiles and mammals. On the other hand, it appears to have been a caring and attentive parent, dedicated to brooding its young. Troodon was also an intelligent dinosaur. Of all known dinosaurs, it appears to have had the biggest brain relative to body size. And a light body and long legs enabled it to run very fast. Troodon teeth were first discovered in the 1850s. But only when scientists found skull material that was more complete, many years later, did they realize they had unearthed a new and distinctive dinosaur. The teeth are very rough serrations along the back edge, used for ripping through meat. A flexible curved and flattened, with wrist and a thumb able to move independently of the other two fingers gave it a strong grasping hand. Together with its speed, these adaptations enabled Troodon to catch small fast-moving prey such as mammals and lizards. Brain size needs to be compared with body size to gain an accurate idea of an animal's intelligence. The relative brain size of Troodon suggests that it was about as intelligent as a parrot. This may not sound very bright, but parrots are extremely clever birds. In Troodon, the parts of the brain involved in sight are enlarged and well-developed. The eyes were its primary hunting tool, and enlargement of other regions of the brain would have given it more control over movement and balance when moving quickly. Its intelligence might have enabled it to coordinate its attacks with other individuals and work as a pack hunter to bring down large prey. Crocodiles and birds are the closest living relatives of dinosaurs. As both groups of animals lay their eggs in nests and look after these eggs to some degree, it is not surprising that dinosaurs behaved in a similar way. Fossilized Troodon nests have been found in Montana, at a famous fossil locality called Egg Mountain. Some nests contain complete eggs, and a few eggs even contain baby Troodon skeletons. Sometimes, adult Troodon bones are found along with nests, suggesting that Troodon sat on top of the eggs to keep them warm in the same way as modern birds do. Around 80 million years ago, the area now smothered by the sands and stony wastes of Mongolia's desert, the Gobi, was home to many dinosaurs and mammals. Abundant in this environment were the hornless protoceratops, the meat-eating velociraptor, and several types of ankylosaurs. Skeletons were also discovered of a very unusual dinosaur oviraptor, a small theropod with a short domed skull, a toothless beak and a bizarre head crest. The crest was probably covered by a horny sheath, as is a similar looking crest in a living bird, the cassowary. Cassowaries move quickly on land, and the crest helps them pass through dense undergrowth by pushing leaves and branches aside as they run. It has been suggested that the crest of Ovaraptor might have functioned in a similar fashion. But the Mongolian environment was quite arid, and there may not have been much dense undergrowth. It is possible that the crest functioned as a display and recognition structure instead. The skull of Ovaraptor is very unusual. It is full of openings and in some places it is composed of only very thin struts of bone. The snout is very short, the skull is deep and there are no teeth in the jaws. Instead, the roof and the floor of the mouth are expanded to provide a wide bony surface. When the animal was alive, this area would have been covered by a wide horny beak with sharp edges. The single crest rises from above the nostrils and stretches backward to a point just in front of the eye sockets. It is also full of openings and air chambers. Oviraptor possessed a wishbone, or furcula, that is very similar to the structure found in modern birds. Its arms are long and thin, and a crescent-shaped bone in the wrist permitted twisting of the hand. The first finger is much shorter than the other two, yet each finger terminated in a large, narrow claw. Its long limbs are long and slender and the tail is short. These features suggest that Ovaraptor was agile and fast-moving. In the early 1920s, a party of researchers from the American Museum of Natural History in New York, set off on an expedition to Mongolia with the aim of finding fossils of the earliest human beings. 
They did not discover any human fossils, but they did uncover a wealth of dinosaur and small mammal fossils. Protoceratops fossils were very abundant, as were nests full of dinosaur eggs, which were assumed to belong to Protoceratops. Found on top of one of these nests was the partial skeleton and skull of a unique new theropod, apparently fossilized in the act of feasting on Protoceratops eggs. This animal was named over after Philoceratops, meaning Ceratopsian loving egg thief. Joint Polish Mongolian and Soviet Mongolian expeditions in the 1970s discovered more Oviraptor material, providing scientists with further information about the skeleton and appearance of this dinosaur. In 1993, a baby Oviraptor was found within a fossilized egg. The egg was part of a nest that had originally been thought to belong to Protoceratops, but the baby Oviraptor proved otherwise. The Oviraptors found on top of the nest were not stealing eggs, as had been thought originally, but were brooding them. It appears that the mother oviraptor had perished on top of the nest while protecting her eggs during a sudden slumping of sand dune. The types of rocks in which oviraptor skeletons are found very rarely preserve soft tissues. But it is possible that oviraptor had some kind of fuzzy or feathery covering over its body, as other closely related theropods are known to have these features. Feathers, particularly along the arms, might have helped in incubation or in shading the eggs from the harsh midday sun. Although not large, Deinonychus was a ferocious meat-eating dinosaur. Its discovery in the 1960s introduced paleontologists to a whole new method of dinosaur attack and feeding. Instead of relying on a large head with powerful jaws, like most of the bigger carnivores, Deinonychus used long arms to hold its prey, with legs and toes delivering the all-important killing strike. It probably hunted in packs, rather like wolves do today. Deinonychus and its close relatives, such as Velociraptor, shared a peculiar feature of the foot they walked only on the third and fourth toes. Attached to the tip of the second toe was a huge, curved claw, twice as long as the claws on toes three and four. One of the joints on the second toe flexed against the others in a way opposite to normal joints, so that the rest of the toe and its great claw were always held off the ground, as in true dantids. The claw was covered by a huge, sharp, horny sheath like those of birds and cats. Its arms were relatively long and powerful, and three long fingers each ended in a sharp, curved claw. Deinonychus probably leapt at prey with arms and legs extended, its long, bony tail aiding balance. While the arms gripped the prey, the legs kicked backward and the sickle-like claws sprang into action. Recent fossil discoveries of feather-like structures in close relatives of Deinonychus suggest it might have had a feather-like covering, too. As tall as a six-story building, as long as three buses, as heavy as half a dozen elephants, this gargantuan sauropod is the biggest land animal known for sure to have existed. Argentinosaurus was the perfect herbivorous eating machine, everything about it was intended to help it eat as much as possible, as quickly as possible, extracting the maximum energy possible from what it ate while expending very little in doing so. Its long neck let it reach high, low, and wide to crop leaves from trees and bushes while keeping its heavy legs planted on the ground. It didn't waste time or effort chewing, it just swallowed the leaves whole and let the bacteria in its gut break the fibers down. Not needing heavy teeth for chewing meant its head was light and easy to support. And so it evolved ever bigger, doing so in a symbiotic relationship with Mapusaurus. Its discovery began in 1988, when a Patagonian sheep farmer named Guillermo Heredia found what looked like a petrified tree trunk on his land. But the more he peered at it, the more it intrigued him. And when he called in a team of paleontologists from the Carmen Furness Municipal Museum, they concluded that it was a 1.5 meters, 5 feet shinbone. Further excavations took time it took five men to haul out a mighty lump of rock that turned out to contain a single vertebra, but eventually a, a few more vertebrae, fractured ribs and the sacrum were extracted from the Huinkle Formation Stone, enough to gauge the animal's size. Jose Bonaparte and Ricardo Coria named Argentinosaurus in 1993, and a general public raised on the idea that Brachiosaurus and Apatosaurus were the biggest dinosaurs had to think again. With a skull the length of a man and a body as long as a bus, this is perhaps the biggest predatory carnivorous dinosaur ever known. Some experts believe that it grew bigger than Tyrannosaurus, though others are more conservative and suspect that both genera's biggest individuals were of similar size. In any case size is one thing, intelligence quite another. 
Although paleontologists don't have much time for such questions, it is tempting to wonder which dinosaur would win in a battle between Gigantosaurus and Tyrannosaurus. Even if we accept the idea that Gigantosaurus was longer, two tons heavier and had bigger jaws, which were full of teeth shaped for slicing flesh, Tyrannosaurus had a bite three times as powerful, broader and more varied bone-crunching teeth, and a bigger brain. The question is entirely speculative in any case, as the two dinosaurs lived 30 meters years apart and on separate continents. Gigantosaurus discovery in Argentina showed that South America was not only the land where dinosaurian life may have begun, it was also where it reached its pinnacle in terms of size. Like its fellow massive Carcharodontosaurids, Gigantosaurus lived alongside gigantic herbivores. Its fossils were found in 1993 by amateur fossil hunter Ruben Dario Carolini near those of the Titanosaurid Andesaurus and Rebichisaurid Limesaurus. Like its relative Mapusaurus, Gigantosaurus, the giant southern lizard, may have hunted these mammoth beasts. With a high ridge along its back, a huge pair of hooked extending claws, a meter-long mouth packed with 68 serrated teeth and a body the length of a lorry, this is one of the most spectacular killers of the Cretaceous. It was probably a Carcharodontosaur, along with Mapusaurus, Gigantosaurus, Tyrannotitan and the dinosaur that gives that group its name, but its appearance sets it apart from the rest. The ridge's function is uncertain but experts have a good idea of how Acrocanthosaurus hunted. A study of its forearms showed that they lacked the flexibility to grab other animals but once it had lunged its head forward and caught its prey in its jaws, it could then impale its victim with its claws, holding the body in place while it ate. S several sets of large footprints have been found in Texas that seem to show a theropod moving in packs. Those footprints that are now set in stone would have been cast in mud on a coastal floodplain bordering the shallow inland western interior seaway. They are generally attributed to Acrocanthosaurus, which would not have been a quick runner, its thigh bone was longer than its lower leg bones, a sure sign that pace was not among its attributes. But by working in groups this huge hunter could have assailed almost anything it chose to pursue. Its bones were first found in Oklahoma and described in 1950. Was this a four-winged dinosaur? Protofeathers covered this intriguing little dromaeosaur's body, but its front and hind limbs. All bore true flight feathers. One view is that it adopted a biplane-like posture, gliding in a shallow U-shaped trajectory between trees in the Asian woodlands, while others think it could fly. Some experts see Microraptor's four wings as an evolutionary dead end, but others note that eagles also have flight feathers on their legs, suggesting they may have evolved from four-winged ancestors. Xu Sing described Microraptor in 2003 and now an estimated 300 specimens are held in museums and institutions around the world. Many preserve details of feathers, which hint at dark and light bars of color. Its great abundance in the fossil record shows that Microraptor must have been one of the commonest little predators in its habitat. In 2011 Xu and two colleagues described a specimen with the fossilized bones of a small bird in its stomach, another contains remnants of a small mammal's bones. The bird Xu mentioned lived in the trees rather than on the ground, so the fossil provided possible evidence that Microraptor hunted in trees. Its claws would have enabled it to scale trunks and branches in pursuit of prey. This behavior reinforces the idea of a down from the trees rather than up from the ground origin of flight. Microraptor's eyes seem suited for nocturnal activity, suggesting it hunted under cover of darkness. Dagger-like lower front teeth jutting straight out of its mouth mark Majicosaurus out as a little carnivore like no other. It perplexed its finders at first, they were unsure whether it was even a dinosaur until they examined the entire jaw and found that, while the first four teeth gradually inclined from near horizontal to vertical, the back section was more typical of a theropod. So why did the front teeth develop so strangely? A good rule of thumb in trying to ascertain why extinct animals evolve certain features is to observe the behavior of any comparable animals alive today. An odd little group of South American marsupials called shrew opossums have similar fangs and use them to prong insects, then using their hind teeth for biting and chewing. It is suspected that the considerably larger Majicosaurus used a similar technique to catch fish and small vertebrates. By the late Cretaceous Madagascar had been an island for 20 meters years, having split from India and drifted toward Africa. Then as now it was rich with strange animal life, Simosicus, a little pug-nosed plant-eating crocodile, for instance, or Ron Avis, a controversial creature that may have been a bird or possibly a flying dromaeosaurid dinosaur. Certainly among the Madagascan dinosaurs was Majungasaurus, which probably preyed on Majicosaurus judging by the tooth marks on one of its fossil bones. 
It was described in 2001 after being discovered in Madagascar. Maziaka is Malagasy for vicious, and the species name reflects the fact that the researchers from the University of Utah were listening to dire straits as they unearthed the jaws, some limb bones and vertebrae. In 2011 a new find meant that two-thirds of the skeleton is now known, greatly improving experts' understanding. It was a kind of abelisauroid termed a nosaurid, which was a small group forming a twig from the branch leading to the powerful, streamlined abelisaurids such as Carnotaurus and Abelisaurus. Those advanced genera were notable for their tiny arms and blunt skulls but in the small, more primitive Majicosaurus the arms were designed for grasping, while the skull was low and elongated. While Majungasaurus may have eaten Maciacosaurus, it definitely ate its own kind for this is the only dinosaur to have been confirmed as a cannibal, though there's some evidence that Daspletosaurus and Tyrannosaurus were as well. Numerous Majungasaurus bones bear marks matching the size, spacing, and serration of its thick, powerful teeth, and no other carnivore its size is known to have lived on Madagascar. Identical chips and gouges are also found on the bones of the island's sauropods, while Majungasaurus wasn't huge by theropod standards, it was the island's dominant predator during the Cretaceous. It had a broad skull for an abelisaurid, a small horn on its head and an especially horizontal posture. In 2007 American paleontologists Scott Sampson and Lawrence Whitmer digitally scanned its skull and discovered this posture by examining the ear canals, which help with balance. The inner ear contains three of these, of which one, the lateral canal, is parallel with the ground in the head's alert position think of it like a natural spirit level within an animal's head. When they positioned a Majungasaurus skull with the canal parallel to the ground, its skull was almost horizontal. By comparison most theropods' heads inclined downwards when alert. Whitmer's 3D digital scans of dinosaurs' skulls, created via a method properly called X-ray computed tomography, have created a detailed understanding of their brain's shape and size, and thus of their likely posture, sensory perception, and behavior. The method is also far less labor-intensive and destructive than sawing through great chunks of stone. Like most other abelisaurids, Majungasaurus' arms were very small, its strongly muscled jaws were its means of attack. The teeth were perfect for gripping into sauropods' flesh, and the powerful neck helped it shake its victims while it held them, inflicting fatal wounds. It could then rip lumps from the carcass once the kill was complete. Compare this with the slender, knife-like teeth of Carcharodontosaurs, better suited to slashing slices of meat from living animals' flanks. Its stout, muscular legs were unusually short, giving it a low center of gravity and a slow running speed but it only needed to be faster than the sauropods that it pursued, such as Rapidosaurus. Majungasaurus remains were discovered in 1895 by French soldiers who were trying to recover Madagascar from the British, and the following year it was mistakenly assigned to Megalosaurus. New partial finds in 1955 led to it being named Majungasaurus, after the fossil site's location in Madagascar, but a detailed picture only developed with the discovery of an exquisitely preserved skull in 1996. Since then more specimens have combined to provide knowledge of almost the entire skeleton. Footlong claws on arms strong enough to puncture tough fish scales. Crocodilian jaws lined with conical teeth. A dorsal sail the height of a human atop a body as long as a lorry. Everything about Spinosaurus induces awe and fear, for this incredible theropod is the biggest carnivorous dinosaur known to have lived. And while most of the huge hunters represented variations on fundamentally the same body plan, Spinosaurus and its relatives were something different something extremely specialized and all the more memorable for it. But only now is Spinosaurus coming to the forefront as one of the mightiest beasts of the Mesozoic era. It was discovered in 1912, 10 years after Tyrannosaurus, but for decades our picture of its appearance was too hazy for Spinosaurus to imprint itself on the popular imagination in the same way. A German expedition led by the aristocrat Ernst Freiherr Stromer von Reichenbach brought home from Egypt a series of vertebrae bearing spines up to 1.65 meters 15 feet 5 inches, high in the lower section of a long, crocodilian-like jaw. These intriguing bones were described, illustrated and housed in the Bavarian State Collection of paleontology in the region's capital Munich, but in April 1944 Allied bombs rained down on the area, targeting the nearby Nazi party headquarters and devastating the museum. 
Having spent 95 meters years preserved in the rocks of the Sahara Desert, the Spinosaurus fossil was destroyed after three decades contact with humanity. Then almost 40 years later a baryonyx claw appeared in an English quarry and unlocked Spinosaurus secrets. The fossil subsequently recovered was the first good Spinosaur skeleton, looking similar to Stromer's illustrations of those lost Spinosaurus remains, only smaller and lacking such extended spines. By comparing the two, paleontologists deduce Spinosaurus overall proportions, scaling up from the more complete baryonyx. The creature that emerged from their calculations had a body up to 18 meters, 59 feet, long, with 2 meters long 16 feet 6 inches, arms wielding 38 centimeters, 15 inches, meat hook claws, and a probable 1.75 meters, 5 feet 9 inches, skull, its elongated jaws studded with curved, conical, interlocking fangs. So why did it evolve such a strange and specialized form? Doing so allowed the Spinosaurus to carve out their own niche alongside more conventional theropods. Spinosaurus lived alongside the mighty Carcharodontosaurus, which was smaller but probably more powerful and had heftier jaws. Rather than compete with Carcharodontosaurus for dominion of the land, Spinosaurus focused on ruling the waters. Carcharodontosaurus could feast on sauropod flesh, Spinosaurus would gorge itself on fish and shore-dwelling animals, much as crocodiles do today. And if it seems unlikely that something so gargantuan could subsist primarily on fish, the lakes of Cretaceous Africa contain 3 meters long, 10 feet, colicants called Mawsonia, huge lungfish, and a formidable 8 meters, 26 feet, sawfish called Oncopristis, among other substantial species. In 1975 fossil fragments found in the red sandstone of Morocco's Kem Kem Desert added more skull material, wedged between a section of jaw and tooth was a probable Oncopristis vertebra. The discovery of the well-preserved Sucomimus revealed that the family's skulls were even narrower than previously expected, less like a crocodile's than a gurial's, with its slender snout leading to a bulbous tip that helps secure wriggling prey in the jaws. This strengthened their ability to catch fish and reduced the likelihood of their killing large terrestrial dinosaurs. Along with its smaller relative irritator, Spinosaurus had nostrils high up its snout, allowing it to breathe while largely immersed in water. A French study in 2009 assessed Spinosaur fossils level of oxygen isotopes, which are higher in aquatic animals, and concluded that they had a semi-aquatic lifestyle, spending as much time in water as today's hippopotamuses and crocodilian. And its adaptation for fishing may even explain the huge sail along its back, according to an Italian paleontologist. Cristiano Dal Sasso observed that some herons use their wings to cast shadows over water. Fish quickly seek the shade, at which point the heron plucks them from the water with its beak. Did the vast rounded shadow of Spinosaurus sail perform the same function? Corroborating this is a 2005 study in which Dal Sasso found evidence of sensory points within the long snout that served as motion detectors, enabling Spinosaurus to sense fish's movement underwater while its eyes were above the surface. But even if they were primarily piscivorous, Spinosaurus undoubtedly ate whatever they could. For instance, Baryonyx had remnants of a young iguanodon in its gut, though these may have been scavenged. As with other specialized dinosaurs, Spinosaurus' extreme power in one environment proved to be its downfall in another. Around 97 Maya the North African climate cooled sharply reducing its food supply. And Spinosaurus could not adapt. It disappeared from history, and so far North Africa's rocks have yielded only scanty remains just hinting at the size and strangeness of the hugest known theropod dinosaur.